episode 40. <laughs> do you remember when you turned 40? What did you do when you turned 40? What did I do when I turned 40? I actually, I was uh, still living in Amsterdam and uh, we rented a boat and uh, we went through the canals. That's what I did. How about you? I remember I hired um, a restaurant, invited a load of friends around to enjoy the party. Um, needless to say, I was off my face. And the next day when I went back to collect all my presents, I gave a 500 dirham tip to the waiter. Now, 500 dirhams is roughly about, what, about $130, $140. So the waiter loved me and almost followed me home. And my wife turned around to me. Actually, I gave a tip before I left that evening because he took all my presents to look after them. And my wife looked at me like, you can never come back to the house again. You're an idiot. So uh, I think it was worth it, but you don't do it too often, I think. 45 days in quarantine. It's, uh, we have our counter just uh, above your head. <laughs> Yeah, 45 days, incredible. And it, it's really strange. It just feels normal now. I never thought it would do, the idea of going out. So I went out yes, uh, earlier to drop some bin bags into um, the, the trash across the road. And it's maybe a five second walk, if that. But the five seconds there and the five seconds back felt like I was a burglar or a thief or, or something dodgy invading the space because up and down the street there's just cars covered in dust and it's really strange it, it literally like the walking dead but in every house is people same as we are doing their own thing so that's what we're going to get used to it's going to be like that for a lot longer after the quarantines get lifted as well oh yeah absolutely you know today's uh today's thumbnail i uh, it's one of my favorites uh I, of course it's 40 episodes but for me i one of my uh, fantasies when I was a kid, as I wanted to be thrown out of one of those human cannons. I wanted to be catapulted through one of those human cannons. And every really? time I am fascinated about that kind of thing. So I think that's. Uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna be very creative on this uh, episode because we have a lot of tools and a lot of very interesting, uh, very interesting stuff to share with everybody. Have you ever wondered about how it would be to actually be catapulted in one of these human cannons? No, <laughs> not, one, not even now. Not even now am I thinking about, wow, I'd love to be catapulted out of one of those things. Why? Because it's stupid. But <laughs> please, don't let that stop you. Enjoy your fantasy, and maybe one day we'll get to experience it together with me going, well done, Ernesto, and you going, ow. Are you still afraid of heights? Um, I'm not keen on heights, no. Okay. All right, so that might be the reason. <laughs> it's a fear of getting fired out of a cannon. It's not that, it's, it's being a bullet. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> moving on, moving on, moving on. But we have some, also some uh, interesting things that uh, were happening with Facebook. I mean, this just happened, so it's breaking news. Just share, uh, share with, uh, uh, with us what's actually happening in Facebook right now. Yeah, Facebook have started to say that artists who want to create live streams of their music or their shows, or whatever they're creating right now can actually start charging for the privilege so people can treat it like a proper concert. That makes it very interesting. Makes it interesting to see whether they're going to start um, putting um, limits on using music that's not royalty free. So a DJ, for instance, playing music that's not their own type, their own invention, would that get stopped and blocked? Or will that be fair game to do it? If it is the case that it's allowed to go ahead, then that's going to be really interesting for bars and clubs and concerts because they can still do it from their garage or their front room and they're going to have a ton of people paying to see the concert. And I think that's going to change the game massively. Um, but we'll just have to see how soon people are willing to do that. Because right now when you see the likes of Lady Gaga doing that incredible thing with Paul McCartney and the Rolling Stones and Elton John and so on, they couldn't charge for it. But if it's a subscription system, that changes the game again. But we'll see. Uh, hey, let's uh, let's just get started. You have some really interesting stuff on joint ventures, which I think it's uh, one of those things that can help us uh, catapult our business. Because I believe very strongly that if you are doing this on your own, things will not work. I mean, this show will not be the same if it's only me or, well, if it's only you, possibly you are uh, a much more experienced 
uh, radio personality, and uh, and of course, possibly you will be able to pull this off, as I possibly might be able to pull the toilet papers, uh, to toilet paper diaries on my own. But I think uh, here the important thing is the combination of both, what we both bring to the table, and that's basically what joint ventures is all about. So possibly you would like to start with your. Uh, a great piece on joint ventures. I have no doubt if I wasn't here, you'd be able to use toilet paper on your own. That's not, not going to be an issue. So you get into the <laughs> I, groove. I will find my groove, groove on my own, right? <laughs> you find your groove without any particular roadmap or diagrams to be drawn. Yeah, joint venture, um, joint venture partnerships are fascinating ways of being able to grow businesses. And it's something that I think you'll see a lot more of happening right now because you've got, you've got to have a couple of different things involved. You've got to have somebody who's got the finances to be able to put something together, somebody who's got the resources, and or somebody who's got the know-how. So the way that it works is supposing you're creating something that's a really great idea, but you don't know how to get it to a certain audience, but you have something that's a certain audience. Like, for instance, supposing you have, um, you've got a restaurant that's got some incredible food that you make, but you haven't really got an audience to take it to. And right now you're on lockdown, so people can't come to you. But what you can do is partner with an organization that's got a massive database of people who would like your stuff. So let's take, for instance, Pete um, Garcia with his incredible new show, um, which is uh, uh, After the Unmasking. Is it after, after the Unmask? It was his first show yesterday anyway. So Pete, for instance, supposing he had a restaurant where he was creating Tex-Mex food but he couldn't necessarily get it out to the restaurant because it's closed. What he could do is tap into the, the, the US-Mexico Chamber of Commerce for all the people who already understand and like the food and get delivery service to look after those people. Now it might be, but he's got to do some kind of profit share with the people that actually have the database. But that's what a joint venture is about. So that would be very simple if you think about, okay, well that's how a lot of business gets done. But here's the element that makes it even more interesting. Being a joint venture broker means that you are in the middle of it. So you know somebody who's got a product and you know somebody who's got a need. So why don't you marry the two together so then they can do the business and you just get paid a commission on it. Now, does it have to be contracted? Well, yes, you do really have to contract it. You can put it down to just a shake of hands and say, you know, we'll, we'll honor this gentleman's agreement. But in many cases, that's not enough, especially when it goes on for quite a long time and people are fighting over this and fighting over that, you prefer to have it written down and so you know exactly what your deal is. And your deal might be a finder's fee, 5%, 10%, 20%. You can call it depending on what the needs are of the people. But this could be incredibly lucrative when you talk about, for instance, somebody who's got ships, in, and the ships are in port and not going anywhere, and somebody who needs to get their stuff around the world but has got no visible means of being able to do it cost-effectively, partner them together, hire the ships or get the ships to be um, a preferred partner of this product and it works very well so you can introduce them because you've got a massive database now where this becomes interesting is if you already have tons of people connected to you on your social media whether it's linkedin or it's instagram or it's facebook and you can see what their profession is then when somebody has an issue or a problem you can start looking through and introducing people now, you want to have some kind of contract in place, like a digital contract, if you can do, one where people can sign and something that's got some kind of legal venture involved in it. It doesn't have to be, but just to stop you feeling left out if people don't pay you the commission later on, which is very likely in many cases, then you want to make sure you've got that going on. Now, there's a couple of challenges that go on. First of all, you want to have complete clarity, whether you do it with contracts or you don't do it in contracts. You want to make sure that this is clear from the very beginning. You want to make sure that the cultural differences between the parties are also on the same page. You've got to make sure that if somebody's bringing money to the table, somebody's bringing product to the table, or somebody's bringing expertise to the table, they've all got a monetary value in each other's eyes. Because, for instance, if you've got a service which is you're brilliant at doing law, and somebody else has got a, has got a product, then they might say, yeah, but you just, you just sat there for 10 minutes and you put together a very rough contract, we're not paying you all this money for that. Well, without that rough contract, you wouldn't have known how to do it. Without the connection of the two people that put you in contact with the guys who are shipping the stuff for you, you wouldn't have known how to do it. So it's got to be very clear from the offset exactly what people bring to the party. So that also means, as you can see in the picture in front of us, the top picture is about having a win-win. Every time you have a dispute 
And it's natural of any business to have disputes and to have issues. It's got to be win-win. What that means is you both have to get something out of it. Now, I'll describe very quickly what a win-win negotiation is. I mean, United Nations use it when two countries are warring. So you've got a country that hates another country for lots of different reasons and vice versa. And so you want to make sure that there's peace. Now, if one country wins, then it's a 1-0 win. If the other country wins, it's a 0-1 win. But what you're looking for is to make it so not only do they both win, but they actually grow something bigger out of it. You, want, you don't want, you know, one plus one is two. You want to get three, four, five, six or beyond as the score. So this is how you do it. You start off by asking, if you're negotiating with a win-win, you say to the person in front of you, what do you want out of this whole venture? What is it that's a challenge and what do you want? And you write down every single thing that they want. And then you tell them what you want. Now, often, if you don't do this, the things you're having an argument about is because you don't know that they're after a completely different thing to you. You just assume that it's your problem, but they're fighting you against, and they might not even have a problem with that. So you find out what they want and ask them again, is there anything else that you need to do? And they'll say yes or no. When you've got that complete list, you say what you want, and then you marry the two together and see what you can tick off and find a natural win on. And some things you can say, we'll just leave it as it is. We can't work on that but it's only such a small thing, we'll ignore that. And you build it up so you both get what you want out of it. So then you can turn around feasibly and say, look, no deal, it's not gonna work. Let's just postpone it or let's walk away from the table. But what you're really after is a win-win. So investigate it yourself, have a look at joint venture broking. I think if you're sitting at home with a database on your social media, with a brand that says that you can be trusted and the ability to connect people, it could be a massive way of earning extra income, and these do take a long time. You could be talking months before something comes through, so you're actually throwing out fishing nets all over the place to see what catches something that's gonna bite. But you track them, and we know some people have done very, very well, become millionaires overnight with some significant deals that they've made just because they connected people, and other people just didn't get around to making it. So if you're sat home thinking, what can I do? Well, maybe you can do that. Joint venture broking. Google it and good luck. Yeah, that is uh, that is so true. I mean, we we know several people that have done uh, very well with uh, joint uh, joint venture brokering, and uh, I think it's also really interesting that uh, this is something that everybody can do because you know somebody that knows somebody. I mean, it looks like it's something from the mafia, but that's exactly how it is. I mean, we know uh, people. We can actually put people together and we can uh, get some money done. So uh, let me just share with you guys um, some of those tools that you're going to require to start getting yourself there uh, on the marketplace. And this is something that Dave and I, we have had it for about 10 years, I think. It's a tool that is called About Me. Uh, you know, it's surprising. It really absolutely surprises me. If you go there and Google my name, Ernesto Verdugo, you're going to get over 1.3 million results. The reason why that happens is because I have been for over 20 years working on all sorts of stuff. Obviously, you're not going to be able to uh, you're not going to be able to to pull that kind of numbers. And I am not really the one that has the most. I mean, it's not that everybody knows me, but the truth is very few people uh, have taken the time to actually start creating a profile online. So right now you're going to need to create a profile online and that doesn't mean that you need to have a, a an own website so what you need to do is you have to go to this uh, website which is absolutely brilliant uh, it is called about.me and then you can put a nice picture of you you can put uh, a nice description of who you are what your services are all your social media and because of course this website already has a lot of clout you will be able to be picked up very fast by the search engine. So when people look for you, they're going to find you right away. So as soon as the show is finished, don't do it yet. As soon as the show is finished, go to About Me and make sure that you actually create your About Me page, which is really super uh, important and super powerful uh, right now. We're getting some really nice uh, comments from uh, our friend uh, Andrea Gomez. Uh, she's she's telling us that uh, she loved the show yesterday, uh, that it was one of the best. So thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you. 
And uh, thank you. And we're getting also uh, Pete, which uh, very, very in a little bit later, we're going to have our second show, which is called Prepare to Unmask, saying John Venture Specialist opens door. Absolutely, 100%. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Pete. If you have any comments or you're watching the show live, let us know so that we can give you a shout out. Now, let me just go to my other tool. And this other tool you're going to absolutely love. I've been using them recently. I mean, I discovered this tool about a week ago, and I really like it. It's called dictation.io. And in dictation.io, uh, all you do, um, it only operates in Chrome. First of all, it only operates in Chrome. So you need to go there in Chrome, and uh, then you can just start talking to your microphone, and you can start saying, uh, dear Mike, I want to send you this email because I want to reconnect with you because of this pandemic, blah, 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 blah. And you dictate whatever you want, and it's going to write the whole thing. Now, the magic about this uh, website is that it only, uh, not only it does it in English, but it does it in about 30 different languages, including Spanish, and it's incredibly accurate. I mean, it has, I think about a 90% accuracy. Of course, it will have some things that it doesn't really understand, especially with my English. For example, in my English, but that is not only dictation. I mean, if I talk to Alexa or if I talk to Google, they have no clue what they're doing, and my kids also have fun. But anyway, this is just a great tool for you to actually be uh, playing with. Now, my next tool that I also want to share with you today, mind you, I am a, uh, I am a, uh, Firefox uh, user. So that means that, I mean, of course, I use Chrome and I use uh, mainly Chrome and Firefox, but uh, I like Firefox because the it is an independent company and there's several reasons where actually I'm not going to go. Um, I also want to share. Whoops, what's going on? Oh, suddenly I, I have an echo. <laughs> Let me just. Oh, here we go. So. Uh, Sorry, yeah, it I wasn't going to start to start it. So my, my third tool that I want to share with you, and this is really super useful, it's called Firefox Send. I really find it uh, really weird when people are sending you files, I mean, uh, that they use, I mean, the reason why I don't like WeTransfer is because the links only last for about a week so you have to really be really rushing so to, to, to download that um then of course if you go to dropbox you have to pay and uh, you have to do all sorts of uh hoops and, and and all sorts of things so that actually can work this one is great this is a way to send i think it's up to one terabyte or something like that or two terabytes of information that you can actually send in a file that will easily create a link without you having to have a um, have a, a, an email dropping an email or anything. So it's really super, super useful. And I have one extra tool that I want to share with you. And this one, it's called Pastebin. Pastebin, it's also super useful because how many times it has happened to you that you find some interesting article online or suddenly you find some interesting uh, picture or or whatever it is, and you want to share it. And uh, of course, I mean, you can just share it and then copy paste and share it in, in uh, WhatsApp or share it in Facebook or share whatever it is. But let's say that you would like to actually have a link where you can share a picture, where you can share a uh, text. You can just paste it there on Pastebin and uh, share it with as many people as you would like. So those are my tools uh, of the day, which I think are gonna be helping you for your leverage. And uh, I hope that they've been useful. Dave, have they been useful? Did you take some notes? I've been making notes and checking out the websites just as you mentioned it on my phone. Brilliant. Really useful. The About Me one has been something that's been around for, what, 10 years or so? Something like that. And I think that right now the biggest challenge for anybody is if they're, if they're scared of going out and posting, which many people have, is it like a fear of public speaking, then you do need to leave some kind of digital trail for people to find you. The About Me one is less cluttered than LinkedIn. You can make it very simply about who you are. You can use it on a social scale. You can use it for your business as well. And it's such an easy um, way to find you because literally you've got one page of all your, your details on, all your links, all your social media, and that could be your new digital business card. So I really do recommend that as a great one. All the rest of them are gonna have a look at. Because as I mentioned, if this uh, app, uh, Dictation.io, 
if it's able to understand your accent and my accent, we will produce a brand new book at the end of every show. And that's something that everybody's going to want to read, but maybe not everybody, like anybody, including us. Well, I have like a sort of like a fight with uh, with Alexa because I mean I ask her stuff, and she keeps on saying that she doesn't understand, and my kids just absolutely laugh their head off. Is it my is my English so difficult to understand? Sorry, is my. <laughs> You got me. <laughs> oh my god! No, it's okay. not. It's, it's, it's like wonderful. wonderful. <laughs> I love everything you say. Anyway, uh, I I uh, I want to also show you guys uh, something which I think it's uh, very important, which is happening right now. A lot of people. The reason why they might be having difficulties in getting uh, ahead with uh, all these challenges which uh, the coronavirus is bringing us is because they have some sort of marketing uh, marketing myopia. People don't really see what is uh, really going on. So I have a really nice video that I want to share with you if before I find you, it. Before you do, um, people might not be aware of what myopia means. It's a kind of blindness. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a marketing blindness if you don't understand what myopia is before you show the video. Okay, so yeah, it's a marketing blindness why uh, uh, people don't really have success in business. Have a look. Every year, some 30,000 new consumer products are launched, and 90% of them fail. A key reason is what the late Harvard Business School professor Theodore Levitt famously termed marketing myopia, a nearsighted focus on selling products and services rather than seeing the big picture of what consumers really want. As he used to tell his students, People don't want to buy a quarter-inch drill. They want to buy a quarter-inch hole. The railroad lines are a classic case study. They fell into a steep decline because they thought they were in the rail business rather than being providers of transportation. Instead of branching out into cars, trucks, or airplanes, they let other companies steal away their passenger and freight traffic. Or take oil and gas companies. They've belatedly started to think of themselves as energy providers, but they still devote most of their resources to petroleum. If they fail to develop alternative fuels, they risk becoming companies without an industry. Many others have made, and continue to make, the same mistake. Organizations invest so much time, energy, and money in what they currently do that they're blind to the future. They get lulled into thinking they're in a growth industry, rather than continuously capitalizing on growth opportunities. To avoid the same fate, leaders should ask themselves, what business are we really in? They need to understand that the goal isn't to sell things, it's to satisfy customers. And accept the fact that most existing products and services can, and will, be replaced by competitive alternatives. Then they can identify new offerings that meet consumers' needs sooner than any existing or potential competitor. That's the cure for marketing myopia. Absolutely brilliant. And it's very true. So many opportunities people miss because they just don't think about the end results. Because if you ask the question, what's in it for me, you'll get a better idea of who it is that you're doing business with and why they should want to do more business with you. If you don't ask that question, you're only thinking about who you'd normally um, be doing business with. And that's not a guaranteed business model anymore. Since people went underground, the conventional bricks and mortar systems that we've had for hundreds of years have no value. Everything's online, everything's digital, unless you're in a basic service, whether it's healthcare, cleaning, delivering food, or basic stuff like that. So yeah, you do have to have a, a new makeover of your mindset relating to your business and your marketing. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And I have a question for everyone watching, whether it is uh, on the replay or it is live right now. Do you guys understand the sentiment of the people in your marketplace or the people that you want to become your customers? And I think this is a very important question if you really want to uh, pivot or if you want to leverage or you want to really catapult your business right now that we are through the pandemic. And uh, this is a, an interesting thing. You are right now in lockdown. Many restaurants are not working. Uh, 
salons, bars, restaurants are not working. By the way, right now, Texas just started opening up, and right now we're start going to see some more uh, places opening up. However, the sentiment is going to linger. And the sentiment, that basically means how are people feeling right now? The same way as you feel because you are now in captivity, <laughs> if you want to use that word. But you you are also having to set yourself into the feet, into the foot of the, um, or into the shoes, not into the feet, into the shoes of the other. That's why Alexa doesn't understand me sometimes. Because half the time it doesn't make sense to you and you just said it. <laughs> yeah, I know. So anyway, if you have to put yourself into the shoe of the of the customer. So let me just show a video about how the advertising that now Heineken is uh, actually just launching, which I think understand. I mean, really uh, understands the sentiment of where all uh, are right now. And this is really resonating all over the world. And it's actually increasing sales quite a lot. I love have this. A I love this. I love that. Heineken have some incredible adverts. I remember the ones they used to do for Champions League. There's one that was uh, recorded in reality where these guys had been asked by their girlfriends to come to the opera instead of watching the Champions League final with Inter Milan and Real Madrid. And they filmed it from hidden cameras, these guys all coming into this opera, dragged in by their wives to sit there to watch some orchestra. So then they sat down, the lights went down, and uh, these guys came on stage and started playing instruments. And they're just playing this theme, and it's like, yeah, whatever. And then they start playing the theme to the Champions League. And then the screen goes back, and it's a massive TV screen. Everyone's there, they pass out the beer, and it's the best way to watch the game ever. And it's just an incredible revelation because you're not sure what's going on. And you can see with them, they didn't know either. So Heineken can come up with some incredible ways of not being able to reach people. But I think that it's going to be a while before you see people dancing like that for a while anyway, unfortunately. But that's exactly the sentiment. I mean, we are I feeling, know. well, you know, we're going to go there and the fun is going to start. And then the, suddenly the machine gets stuck and everybody gets paralyzed. I mean, it's a lot of psychology in that ad, which I think is perfect because, of course, it's reaching exactly to the uh, psyche, to the heart of how people are thinking. And that's how you have to think. Whenever you're actually approaching people, you don't have to go there and try to sell them blatantly, but you have to really help them understand and empathize and uh, do all these kinds of things. Now, this is another interesting uh, uh, company, which is also a large company. Possibly you have heard of LG, yep. uh, which I think it's Korean, right, Dave? LG, I think think they might be yeah i think so i'm not yeah, sure they are korean so right now what they are creating is a home brewing system have a look now meet lg homebrew 
our first ever beer maker. Now you can make and enjoy your own cold, tasty beer in the comfort of your own home with little more than a simple touch of the button. You just insert these capsules, which contain malt, yeast, hop oil, and flavoring, and you simply press a button. And from the button, you can select what type of beer you actually want to make. Homebrew automatically takes care of the whole brewing process, from fermentation to carbonation and aging, right through to serving and drinking the beer. It even self-cleans all this in as little as two weeks. The homebrew will produce up to 1.3 gallons, and to keep you involved every step of the way, our mobile app lets you monitor homebrew's beer-making progress from anywhere. LG Homebrew is going to appeal to beer fans all over the world, producing the drink they love with a single touch of the body. Insane, right? Don't you think? Fascinating. That's fascinating. Uh, and it's a genius idea because right now, one of the companies that's, well, one of the industries that's really thriving uh, uh, is the coffee dispenser companies. The companies that, like, for instance, Starbucks, that make um, um, home grown, home grounded uh, coffee. They've got your machine at home or your filter that you can do your plunger thing with, and they'll send you the pre ground um, coffee of your favorite taste. So you can enjoy a Starbucks at home. So it doesn't surprise me. I'd be really fascinated to see that thing about beer was wonderful there. I wonder how many other products will say, let's just produce it for people at home that follow oh, in that trend. Let me give you a hint. And once again, I mean, one of the things that I pride myself of is always uh, predicting trends. And uh, the reason why I have learned and have been so accurate for a number of years predicting trends is because I try to see what has happened in the past and not so much trying to imagine what's going to happen in the future. So let's think about it. Right now, we are probably heading to a time of recession. The biggest recession that happened uh, in the past was uh, the big uh, crash of uh, 1928. And then, of course, we followed the Second World War. This is taking us to this cycle. And uh, who did you think in the Second World War who were the ones that suffered the least? Not the people that actually lived in the cities, but more than anything, the people that lived in the farms. Because in the farms, they had the possibilities of having uh, potatoes or tomatoes or, or whatever. They were able That's to produce years. their own food. And that's exactly one of those keys that you have to think about right now. Every single thing which is right now in the do-it-yourself, in the self-cooking, right now companies like uh, uh, this fresh, um, whatever it's called, uh, they send you the food so that you can prepare it. Every single thing which is a do-it-yourself, especially in things that you have to consume, are going to do very well. So once again, we are just giving you ideas so that you will be able to actually catapult your business. Because I tell you, we are going to have to reinvent yourselves, uh, ourselves, and you have to start thinking differently. And we haven't really addressed real estate as part of our issues here. But if you think about the way real estate works, the closer you are to the heart of a city, the less you've got to commute, the more you spend for a property that's tiny because you've got the convenience of just stepping out, walking into work, walking back, and okay, you've got a small flat, but it's worth a fortune. Nowadays, that's gonna change because if you want a nice big place with a big garden that you can have lots of fun with, you're usually talking about an hour out of a city and it will cost you a fraction of what it would cost for a tiny property inside the city. Well, as soon as you start looking at the ability to uh, avoid coronavirus and work from home, suddenly those those properties that are miles away from town start looking a lot more luxurious and a lot more attractive and also you consider buying one and living there for life as opposed to moving around so much because if you're working from the place of your home why would you need to change it you just go on holiday when you need to but you just stay in that home for a long time so i think a real estate business is going to change dramatically um, as people don't want to step up quite so much, they're happy staying exactly where they are, but they choose a different sort of property from the beginning. Uh, we are getting a call from uh, our good friend and correspondent in the Netherlands, Michael. Yesterday, he actually tried to connect with us to explain to us what was going on in Amsterdam. And for some reason, the technology failed and we didn't manage to connect with him. So let's bring Michael. Michael, 
All right, we're ready for you. Are you there? Michael. There he is. Okay. Hey, thanks, Dave. Hi, Ernesto. Uh, this is Michael coming to you live from the Netherlands. And as an American, uh, I have to say this is one of my favorite days of the year. It is the 28th of April. And every year for almost 30 years now, I've got to celebrate one of the craziest and greatest Dutch holidays known as King's Day. Now, for me, actually, for many years, it was Queen's Day until Beatrix abdicated the throne to her son, Willem Alexander, and it became King's Day. Uh, every year for the Queen's birthday, now the King's birthday, we have a celebration. It all starts the night before with a big party. People start drinking. You see Dutch people that they are out partying until four, five, six in the morning. They go home. They sleep for a few hours. They roll out of bed. They put on orange. They put red, white, and blue, just like the flag on their face, on their... Uh, houses, they put out the Dutch flag and balloons and they decorate. And the day of King's Day, or as it was Queen's Day, uh, the city becomes the weirdest combination of a party and a outdoor garage sale. It's fantastic. It's the one day of the year that you don't have to pay uh, taxes on things. So everyone can go outside and sell anything. So everyone hauls all of their old garbage for weeks before the day begins. People have taped off their little areas on the street like this is mine. It says Bazette. You'll see the word Bazette. It's like they're taken. Uh, and then all during the day, kids are putting hats out and playing, you know, their flutes or they're doing the little dance routines or they're singing and they're doing little acts and there's games, you know, throwing ping pong balls and uh, all sorts of one of my favorite spiker pooper nail pooping they call it that's a, of enough for an, another episode but it is a crazy day there's a cacophony of music everywhere but not this year as you may notice behind me maybe you might see a few there's a dutch flag hanging lonely but listen to the sound of near silence uh, because of the coronavirus this year it's almost completely quiet there are some people who have you know broken the stay-at-home order and gone out to celebrate but you know i'm an adult <laughs> i don't need an excuse to drink every year so it's been a quiet king's day but we still celebrate uh there's a lot of people staying at home uh, lots of great traditions that's still taking place but people are doing it at home so you can't you know, you can't knock the Dutch down, but it is a big difference this year. But as we say, Oranje Bova, the Dutch to the top, the top, the orange, the royal color. We will stay true and we will get through this together. Uh, thanks again for you guys for putting out this great, great show and happy King's Day. Back to you. Happy King's Day, Michael. Thank you so much. <laughs> happy King's Day, Michael. Thank you for your report. Ernesto, can I ask you a question? What spike a pooper? Well, I, very honestly, I have never heard about it. So, but I don't really want to find out. Sounds too painful. <laughs> <laughs> on that bombshell, moving on. Yeah, moving on. We're also having another call. I think it is from North Carolina. I'm not sure exactly where right now Thai is. Mm -hmm. uh, Thai coin is one of the number one. Uh, Amazon Kindle experts in the world. He's an amazing guy, and you definitely definitely have to connect with him. Uh, let me see if Ty is there. Also, he has a really funny sense of humor. So let's see what he has to contribute uh, today. Hey, Ty, are you there? Hello, Ty. Hey, Dave. Hey, Ernesto. So a big positive about being quarantined is that it's kind of taken me away from business a little bit and got me to focus on more of the chores that my wife has on her massive list. So I'm just about to hang some okay, of these lines right, okay. in. Okay, enough fun with your videos. Get to hang those lines. All right, You're back done. to you guys. There you go, life behind enemy lines. Um, I do sympathize. <laughs> Ty, thank you for taking the 20 seconds to share with us your little <laughs> bit for freedom. Quite clearly need to work on that, but not if you want to stay in one piece. So thanks for sharing that, that was brilliant. Oh my God, he's, I tell you, he's, he's really funny. You have to definitely connect with him. He's also amazing in, uh, you know I mean? If you are into Kindle books and that kind of thing, he's the absolute expert uh, on it. Fantastic.
Yeah. So let's uh, let's move to the news. Captain, yeah, Captain Don Moore. Yeah, exactly. So let's see how much. Twenty nine million three hundred ten thousand nine hundred sixty eight pounds. Holy moly! And I think that's what incredible. Was his, uh, his goal was five thousand, right? No, goal was a thousand pounds. He wanted to raise for the NHS, which is National Health Service for the UK. He wanted to walk around on his Zimmer frame, you know, the frame that the old people have to walk around his garden. He wanted to do a hundred laps and raise some money for the nurses and for um, the, 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 the safety equipment uh, and, and just to basically help with charities related to, to uh, nurses. And it's taken off and gone through the roof. He's become a national hero, not just a national hero, a world hero. And, and the thing is, he's 99 years old. At the end of this month, he becomes 100 years old. So he was fighting in the Second World War. Uh, how many years ago? I couldn't tell you. Well, I could tell you, but I'm not going to. Um, but the thing is, He's always been a soldier, as a captain, so now he's fighting a different battle to save for our new warriors, which is our healthcare services in every part of the world. They're the people who are fighting the pandemic. So he's become such a big star now, and he's a lovely little old guy who's just got a huge heart and has raised an unprecedented amount of money um, for people who are putting their lives on, this, on the line every single day. So every time I read that, I fill up, and I want to burst into tears of love. Uh, but it's just an incredible story and, and more power to you, Captain Tom. That's awesome. All the way to the other side of the world. And this is also something, Dave, that you can possibly comment because if not, uh, this I think is also quite interesting. What's going on in Saudi Arabia? Okay, Saudi has made a big change in the last year or so where they realized that they wanted to tap into tourism. In order to do that, they changed the way that they... Um, had a policy about events and theater and the arts and they've opened it up very much taking the lead from what's happening in dubai and many of the other places around the world and they've invited in event organizers um people who put together theme parks entertainment is a very big part now of what saudi is looking to do until the coronavirus hit in but one of the things that they decided to do is invest in live nation which is currently the world's number one um concert provider for big concerts big stars and big spectacles so they've taken a stake of $500 million to be part of that. Part of that will be experienced by big concerts happening in, um, in Saudi, which have already started to happen anyway. But I think that they want to inject into it because they see the growth of the industry and they want to be part of that growth. So well done to Saudi for doing that. Very interesting to support something. I think yeah, that the, the fact they've done it now is interesting because it's like – in 2008, Emirates Airlines, when we had a massive recession, all the airlines were closing down and saying, we can't afford to keep in the skies. We're going to lay off people. We're going to lay off airlines. We're going to lay down planes. Emirates Airlines bought during the time when everybody else was, was stopping it. They went in a different direction investing. So when we came out of that crisis, they became the number one airline in the world because they had better planes, more planes than anybody else. And it was a really smart investment. I think what you've got with Saudi government is they've decided the same thing. We're not going to stay in this lockdown forever. But when we do come out and people start celebrating the Roaring Twenties, or more likely Roaring Twenty Ones and Twenty Twos, then they want to be at the heart of people's minds with that. And uh, it's a smart decision to make. Very good investment. So finally, I will possibly be able to take my wife to Saudi because I've been to Saudi many times and she always says, same. hey, I want to go to Saudi and we have tried in many ways and it has always been impossible so possibly that might be a, an, an interesting thing because Saudi is an it's interesting Saudi. country absolutely I think it's a it's a very interesting country and uh, they have been in uh, lockdown for longer <laughs> than we have <laughs> let's not go there let's move on so have you got some more news without us getting uh, into I live here I live in Dubai I go to Saudi quite a lot just leave it there your wife will yeah, never get I, there, I, I love Saudi. I think it's very, very interesting. Yeah. I, and I find it uh, very, uh, very uh, interesting that now they're getting open. So fantastic. Now, uh, here's also some interesting uh, news that we have been also talking about. <laughs> Apparently, somebody from uh, a reporter from Good Morning America didn't really have the right angle. And uh, he was uh, basically filming and he was in his underwear. So this was actually on national brilliant. television. That's brilliant. You can't see it so well on that. If you've got full screen, then you will be able to see a little flash of leg underneath his um, his jacket. 
And uh, I think that there's a lot more of that going on. I, you know what? There's not a phrase for it yet, but there will be a phrase that somebody will come up with of, can you please stand up just to prove you are fully dressed in your suits before we have this business meeting? Uh, it was always like that. I mean, you were supposed to wear your suit and tie and everything, but with shorts. And uh, right. yeah, I mean, that is just something that now is becoming normal. We have another interesting, uh, interesting uh, news here. Uh, a North Carolina farm. Uh, it is uh, right now rent, uh, renting donkeys and chicken and ducks and uh, cows to actually crash video calls. So you basically uh, send $50 by PayPal to this farm and uh, you send the link of the uh, Zoom call that you would like to crash with an animal. And then suddenly an animal will be actually appearing on your business meeting or in your monthly meeting or weekly meeting and so I mean, that's okay. just another way of actually making money. <laughs> no, so what we're talking about is it shows up from their own camera and their own laptop. It doesn't suddenly appear in your house and walk past no, you. You just <laughs> left it in. That would be weird. Yeah, no, no, no. There's social distancing. So right now, I mean, you have all the, all the meetings, which possibly are incredibly boring. They're in Zoom. So what you do is you send $50, and then they will go there with a camera, with a phone and whatever, and then suddenly there will be a cow watching the, the meeting. <laughs> Livestock makes everything more interesting, unless you're a vegetarian, I guess. You know what I you know what I would love to see? They were talking about something happening in Delhi, and I've seen the video, and it's one of my favorite things of all time, and I don't know if we can share it on this show. If we can, happy days. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Now, we have to have a disclaimer for this, because I think right. this is just absolutely critical. And this disclaimer is that uh, in India, there's a different kind of sense of humor that uh, because, of course, we have uh, a lot of experience uh, dealing with, with people from India, we understand it and we find it funny. However, what will happen if you actually see this anywhere else? Let's have a look and let's just comment about it. Basically, okay, this, is called, this is called the uh, Corona Zombies. Have a look. <laughs> so these are they're meant to be the coronavirus on somebody's head. I know what it looks like. It looks like a head full of men's todgers. It's not. It's a crash helmet, and the police, of course, are walking along there. And the idea is to let people know about the awareness of the coronavirus. But to me, it just looks like there's, a, there's an old movie called Plan 9 from Sputnik or something. And they, they didn't have enough money for a, for a monster, so they kind of dressed somebody up like this. And all people do is just take selfies. It scares small children. Everyone else just loves the photos. But it's hopefully having an impact of letting people know what it is all about. Um, but I'm not completely convinced. That guy's very happy to just, you know, connect with the coronavirus. I've run out of things to say. I'm trying not to get abusive about this, but I mean, there you go. <laughs> well, I mean, all I can say is only in India. I mean, you will not see that anywhere else. Anywhere else, you'll be kicked. You know where. Well, completely. And you, you wouldn't be able to reach it because it's stuck on the guy's head. So <laughs> yeah. there you go. There's many of them. There are so oh many God. jokes I want to share while looking, looking at this. Anyway, I we actually showed it, and I hope that we didn't offend anybody here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, to all our Indian friends, uh, yeah, we, we have love a lot you of anyway. Indian friends, and we love you Tons guys, so we're not making fun, but I think it's just very funny, the sense of humor that you guys have. Hold anyway. on. We are, we are making fun if any of our Indian friends are dressed like that. If that's you, then you deserve all you get. Oh. Everybody else, we love you. Oh, yeah. If you appear with one of those uh, helmets full of dildos or whatever it is what they're wearing. <laughs> oh Did you say that? Did you say that? I have no clue. It just looks horrible. <laughs> anyway. So, there we go. Thank you, Ernesto. Here's another one. Here's another one, which I think is really funny. London man attempting to clap for 24 hours straight to actually help uh, raise money for the, for the NHS. All the Britons are actually doing a lot of creative stuff to get to get money. Yeah? That's interesting. Yes, very interesting. So you've got a single guy on his own who for 24 hours is going to clap. Well, at least his eyesight will improve. 
during the coronavirus, if nothing else. I wish him the very best of luck with that. And, and if he does it, then great. I, I remember we did, a, we did a thing years ago when I used to work for one of the radio stations, and it was the hands on a car competition. We got two smart cars. I mean, invited about 30 or 50 um, listeners to the radio station to come along and put their hand on the car. So you're allowed to have one hand on the car. You could swap it over by putting your other hand on the car and then moving the other one off. If you took both off, then you would be disqualified. You were allowed every two hours, I think it was, to go for a 15-minute bathroom break. But other than that, you had to do it. And we went for about two and a half days. So people could sleep holding onto the car, but they couldn't sleep and lie next to the car, otherwise, otherwise they were out. And we ended up with three people who, in the end, refused to leave the car and they agreed to split the money because whoever had the car last would win it and take it away. But um, very interesting well, is the way of doing it. There was another contest in Mexico that uh, they have to. They wanted to see if they can actually uh, break the record of being inside a Volkswagen, one of those Beatles. Five people, and they had to listen to the Macarena for, I think it was 48 hours in a row. Ooh. <laughs> That's painful. Anyway, they... Believe it or not, we are running out of time again. So I would like to actually leave this um, this show with uh, something very nice, which is happening in Caracas, Venezuela, which I think it's a country that has been suffering tremendously for the uh, past number of years. And uh, right now they are experiencing thumbs, something very nice. And uh, you're going to see what it is in a moment. So have a look. There's uh, cockatoos and uh, really beautiful parrot birds right now because of course i mean there's no human uh, humans around i mean they are just there flying into the buildings and there's ton of uh, tons of very beautiful exotic birds actually flying there isn't that amazing cockatoos beautiful parrots whatever sure. they're called. Well, well it reminds me about the movie rio which i really enjoyed watching all about the blue parrots but right across the world wildlife is getting a second chance to go out in the streets there's pictures yeah. of um panthers and cougars and mountain lions and wolves and all sorts there's herds of wildebeest almost going through streets because nobody's blocking them there's no cars to worry about very interesting to see um how nature is coming back um during this break at least and hopefully during that time you get a lot more um of the endangered species get an opportunity just to be able to maybe get their own back and, and breed a little bit more. But I love that video. That's fantastic. I mean, look beautiful. Yeah, that's absolutely, that's absolutely awesome. Dave, I, uh, I have enjoyed, as usual, doing the show with you, even though we've been showing things that we possibly should not be showing. <laughs> There's nothing that we show that we shouldn't have showed. It's when you use the D word, that's the one that's going to end up with us being in prison. And luckily, we only get about two or 3,000 people watching the show every day. So we're probably going to get away with it. You know, interesting enough, you actually managed to understand that word. I thought that you didn't understand my English. Well, you've got that many of them in your house. At some point, it's going to come out in public. <laughs> Moving on, it's been a beautiful day. Always a pleasure with you. You can go back and put your big hat on. And uh, I look forward to another incredible show with you tomorrow. Take it easy, Ernesto. Absolutely. And uh, take care, everybody. Stay safe. Stay safe. You just call out my name And you know wherever I am I'll come running, 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 running To see you again
You got a 